Hello, I'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, Tech Talks today as a part of Portland State of Mind. I'm pretty excited about this because technology has really radically changed the campus and how we do work. And, you know, I was thinking about it, and uh, 31 years ago, I was a freshman, so I can tell you my age, right? And uh, I was a freshman, and I, and, I, and I got a typewriter as my high school graduation gift. And I was pretty excited because my typewriter had the cartridges for the ribbon, and you could actually pull the cartridge out of the side of the typewriter, and you could put in an erase cartridge. And then I could back up, and then I could retype what I just typed, and I could erase it. And then I could back up again, and I could put in the regular ribbon and type what I'd done. And this is a cool typewriter. It was really cool. Anybody in the room remember anything like that? <laughs> okay, I got a few hands. And in fact, I just got, oh, thank you, Chuck. It's really nice. And so I was thinking about it. He sent me a text message, which I got on my watch. So, you know, things have come a long ways uh, from the days of my typewriter. And I'm the, I have to use these. This is the problem, right, is now I've got the cool watch, and it doesn't say, oh, he said 31 years, wow. I thought he was going to say I love you, but he didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't say that. So things have come a long ways. And, uh, you know, my first job, I'm just going to go off script for a sec. My first job was checking out slide projectors. Anybody remember those slide projectors? And remember the Kodak sync machines that would sync to slide projectors? Anybody remember the 3M tape recorders that would sync the 50 and 150 kilohertz pulses to the ectographic controller, which would control two slide projectors? And you could do this cool show. So you could sync it to audio, and then the slides would advance with the audio. This was really, really cool stuff in 1987. We've come a long way since then. So today our presenters are going to talk about three different things. Uh, the first is looking at accessibility barriers. This is a big issue. It was, it's been an issue all through my career, uh, making sure we deal appropriately with accessibility barriers. And this time it's about technology. The second is uh, challenges, challenges educators face when engaging our students in the online environment. So it's different. It's different than those brick and mortar classrooms. It's different than the slide projectors um, we used to set up and have all that fun with. Doug, did you ever do the sync slide projectors? Oh, yeah. A lot. You, had, you weren't speaking up when I said that. And I'm thinking Doug was probably all over that back in the day. So, all right. And then third, uh, you know, this is threats and you know, discussion about online security. I don't think, uh, you know, I hate to say this because we always think we're in some sort of a special day. But when it comes to security and when it comes to our accounts and our security here at Portland State University, I'm not sure there's been a time that's probably more important than now, given the number of recent attacks we've had. Uh, and when I say attacks, most of them are phishing schemes, but uh, they're getting better all the time. And they're not random anymore. They're specifically targeting us. So that'll be the last presentation in the panel. So we will be passing along a free iPad to every attendee. I'm sorry, no. Do we <laughs> but, I read this wrong, it's, it's the glasses, but we will be passing around this iPad uh, to take attendance, and there's an attendance app on there that you can use. I understand the app is uh, tied to Emma, uh, which is our new communication tool we have on campus. And uh, you just push the button to turn it on, Brenna. There's a passcode. There's a passcode. It was about, hey, hey, that was back to the security. We've come full circle. So we'll be passing that around to take attendance. Uh, unfortunately, it's not free, uh, even though we kind of wanted it to be, but it can't do that. So the first talk. Uh, we are going to talk about accessibility uh, in a wired world today. And uh, unlike the physical world around us, you know, there's a lot of things uh, to consider in the online world. And there's a lot of things to consider actually in the physical world around us. And we on campuses have spent a lot of money over the years when it comes to accessibility. You think about buildings on campuses that now have elevators that didn't before. Uh, and probably wouldn't today if we weren't dealing with accessibility issues and trying to make sure that we are accessible as a campus. You think about all the ramps we've installed and concrete we've poured. And we've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars on college campuses uh, and, and everywhere uh, for accessibility. And in the same way, we need to pay attention to the online environment. So before getting into your presentation, I will move along. Um, but uh, Jen Duggar is with us today. Thank you for coming. And uh, she moved to Portland last December after having worked at Drexel University in Philadelphia for uh, seven years. 
She's involved heavily in a national organization called AHEAD, the Association for Higher Education and Disability. And she speaks to audiences nationwide uh, about this topic. So I'm really excited to have Jen here with us today and welcome. morning. Uh, I just wanted to, before I begin, <clears throat> give a special thanks to the Office of Information Technology for inviting me here today. Usually I have to invite myself, so <laughs> that was kind of nice. Um, so I usually do this presentation in uh, about an hour and a half to two hours, so I'm going to squeeze it into 20 minutes and try not to lose you along the way. There's going to be about 10 minutes, hopefully, at the end for questions, but um, if we end up getting really deep into the content and we don't have time for that, you can always find me afterwards um, or shoot me an email for those of you who are watching this live. So um, first, we'll talk about accessibility in the real world. I was really excited to hear Kirk talk about physical accessibility also, because really, the way in which um, the courts are seeing accessibility online now is very similar to the way they have been seeing physical accessibility needs for a long time. And then we'll talk about online accessibility. And um, I'll show you uh, maybe four different general examples of how to create online accessibility um, back when you when you get back to your offices. And um, finally, if we have time, hopefully I will get a chance to show you some adaptive technology that students are using on the iPad. So let's go. What is accessibility? So first you have to know what it is. In the real world, physical accessibility is having, uh, it's the extent to which basically you have uh, the products, goods, services, spaces available to the greatest number of people possible, right? Um, and who in the real world, I'm using that in air quotes, I guess, who in the real world is responsible for accessibility? Well, we have architects and construction workers, and we have um, people who are designing products and programmers um, who are working in the physical spaces to make all of this work. Business owners are making goods and services accessible. So all of these people are responsible. However, who's also, who else is responsible for accessibility? This is something that I actually witnessed, and I won't name any names, but back when I was in Philadelphia, this may have been on a college campus uh, that I had frequented. Um, but it was, you know, of no fault of the administration. However, these two bicycles are at the top of a very long ramp, and this ramp is the only way a student in a wheelchair could get from one place to the other without having to go around construction and buildings that would have taken them 15 minutes out of the way. So we're all responsible for maintaining accessible spaces. So online accessibility. What is online accessibility? Well, it's exactly what physical accessibility is in the online world. So it's the degree to which, or the extent to which, products, services, spaces are accessible or available to the greatest number of people possible online. And who's affected when spaces are not accessible? Well, obviously, because you have the director of the Disability Resource Center here, you can probably imagine I'm about to say people with disabilities, and I am. Uh, people who have visual impairments, blindness, and just uh, low vision, color blindness, are oftentimes affected when content is not visually accessible. Same for people with hearing impairments who um, may feel like videos, uh, when videos are not captioned or there's no transcripts, that's not accessible to them. Motor-related uh, disabilities is something that we don't often think about, but if you can't use a mouse and content is not easily tabbable, for example, then that also would be um, disabling to you. And for cognitive disabilities, so learning disabilities, um, people who have uh, developmental disorders, for example, these folks may have a hard time if content is not in an organized fashion online. And so there are also there are these folks who are affected, but also people without disabilities can be affected by inaccessible content. So if you're using your mobile device, how many of you have received 
emails from businesses and um, the, the content is all in images. And in order to see what it is they want you to see, they want you to come to a sale, but you have to click view images in order to see that. Well, what if you can't view images? There's no text, so that's not accessible. And what if your view images button is not working? You're not getting that message either. And um, also for people who are trying to access information in challenging environments. So you've probably been in the park blocks on a sunny day. Well, maybe you haven't. <laughs> um, and you're trying to read information from a website and you can't really read it because the glare is such that you can't read the text. And if there were audio, you have headphones and you could, you could hear it, but there weren't, there's not audio. Or if you're on a plane and um, you uh, need to be able to see the captions um, on a video and there are no captions, for example, then it's also not accessible to you. So who's responsible? We all are, right? So there are architects online. There are people who you know, create online spaces for a living. But um, now we're all the architects in a lot of ways. You know? So we have to be conscious of what accessibility is and who it affects when it's not accessible. So why is it so important? We have three. Oh, just wanted that to hang in there for a second. We have three main reasons, the social reason, the business reason, and the legal reason. So the first reason, the social reason, is um, that it's important to do because it's the right thing. This is an example. This is a definition of disability from the social model perspective. I just want you to wipe away everything you ever learned about disability for just one minute, even if you don't even know what you've learned about disability consciously. This is a new way of thinking of it. So here's the definition. And it's from Wikipedia, which I know there are other resources out there. But this is where we go when we need an answer quickly. Right? And it's a good definition. So while physical, sensory, intellectual, or psychological variations may cause individual functional limitation or impairments, these do not have to lead to disability unless society fails to take account of and include people regardless of their individual differences. So essentially, people may have conditions and impairments and disease, but um, we're not disabled. People are not disabled until society effectively disables these people. Um, so in the real world, going back for just a second, this may look like, um, well, actually, I'll give you an example of a, of a positive, uh, a positive example, a good space. So Smith Student Union, for those of you who have been to campus, there's a curb cut that leads from the road to the sidewalk. There's an automatic door opener on the front door. There's an elevator that goes up to the fourth floor. There's uh, automatic door openers on some of the restrooms. There are accessible stalls. So if I'm a person who uses a wheelchair, I may not feel disabled going into that building. I may, not, I may feel like I'm differently abled, um, but I may not feel disabled or as disabled as I feel when I'm going to an inaccessible space on campus. So how can we use this idea online? How can we make spaces online so accessible that people who have disabilities or people who have conditions um, are not effectively disabled by what we're doing, how we're creating those spaces? So one concept is universal design, and I don't have too much time to go into it. This is a whole separate presentation. But basically, this is the idea that if you create spaces that are accessible for everyone, you will effectively create spaces that are accessible for people with disabilities. So it's this idea that instead of building stairs to a building and then a ramp around the side, just create a ramp to the front of the building, and then everyone gets in. So if we do the same thing online, Again, everyone gets in. These are some examples of universal design. Curb cuts, elevators, ramped entrances, kneeling buses. We all use these. People with ability, disability, and varying levels of each. The second argument, the business argument. You can't afford not to do it. 
So accessible websites work on your desktop as well as your mobile device. So if you want to make sure that your students, for example, are um, getting the information they need when they need it, then this is a good place to start. Also, Google loves and other search engines love accessible content. Your content moves up in the search engine uh, list as the more accessible that it gets. <clears throat> And here's something else that's interesting. Stick with me for just a second because on Friday I was putting the final touches on this presentation and I came up with a calculation that I haven't used in a presentation yet, but I want you to hear me, hear me out and see that truly we cannot afford not to do this. So we know that 19% of Americans have a disability. This is what was stated on the most recent U.S. Census. <clears throat> Excuse me. 11.3% of students in higher education have disabilities. But out of those students, only 40% of them come to the Disability Resource Center on their campuses to get accommodations. So approximately 60% of students with disabilities may be without the services or the accessibility that they need. <clears throat> At PSU, this means that approximately 3,336 students may have disabilities. We only have 1,070 students registered at the DRC. If this means that students who are not getting the support that they need may be apt to withdraw or uh, go to PCC, for example, or some other institution, we may be losing 17 million plus dollars. This is not saying that making uh, an online site accessible or a course accessible in the physical world is definitely going to make all students with disabilities you know, graduate in four years. No, but this increases our chances. And what? It increases the chances that other students will also graduate successfully as well because accessibility is beneficial to everyone. The third argument is the one that we're most familiar with, I think. That's the legal argument. And Again, this is a whole separate presentation, but in general, we have three main laws that we follow. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act is for institutions who receive federal funding, and it says that people with disabilities should receive equal opportunities to their education. Um, Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act is actually for federal entities, but this is the only law that exists to this date that goes into specific or specific, I'm sorry, um, aspects of accessibility that need to be met in order for a website to be considered accessible. And then we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, which uh, was most recently revised in 2008, but still did not go into specific aspects of accessibility online, though we do know that all programs, events, activities, services have to be accessible online. So we revert back to uh, what we do on campus and we look towards Section 508 and other ideas that other organizations have about what accessibility online looks like and we do our best to make that work here until there are more specific regulations that apply to higher education. However, the bottom line is that if your content online is not accessible even before a student requests an accommodation, you can be sued. And people are being sued. <laughs> so I'm going to give you, I think, four examples of um, uh, accessibility, what it is, and uh, how you can do it quickly. Does someone have time? I left my phone over there. I'm so sorry. Yes, all right. Okay, great, so I'll try and be very quick. Pictures, so obviously, if you're someone who's visually impaired, pictures can be a problem. One thing to keep in mind is if you create alt text, alternative text, if, uh, if, if you're visually impaired, then you'll hear the text through your technology, which I was hoping to get to. Um, and if you are looking at your phone and you see all of those you know, view image icons, you can also see the text listed there. So again, this is accessible for everyone. Enter alternative text. And um, communicate the purpose of the graphic, not the appearance. So this is a picture of, I guess, daisies. I'm not a 
botanist, but um, so I would say, you know, depending on the context of this, if I were putting this on my website, well, no, I wouldn't put this on my website because it doesn't serve a purpose. Um, but if I were putting this on the website of, let's say, the botanical gardens, I might say, an example of the daisies growing here in the botanical gardens. But if this, uh, this um, image appears somewhere else, the meaning of it, the purpose of it, would be something different. So make sure you're communicating that. Word document formatting. Um, make sure you're using headers. Most of us, in order to create a title for our Word document, might go over here to the left-hand side where it says B for bold, and there's all of these different sizes you can use. But actually, this is the most accessible way to do it. And the reason why is because someone who is blind may be using a screen reader, and they can go through the headings. So they can skip through headings as opposed to having to listen to the entire document. And you can imagine in a textbook or even in a syllabus, this can be really overwhelming. You just want to get to the end where it says what date the final is on, and you have to listen to the whole thing. So this is a way that you can help your students to be more effective learners. And then links. So a bad example of links is for the FAQ sheet, click here. A good example would be click here for the FAQ sheet. Again, students using screen readers can skip through links and they would hear exactly what the linked text is. So if you do the first example, they would just hear click here. Exactly, click here, click here, click here. But with the other, they would hear FAQ sheet, syllabus, etc. And one last thing is consider alternative learning styles. Oftentimes, these kinds of documents get posted to D2L or you know, are scanned and copied and given to students. But keep in mind that while this may be um, easily readable for some, it's not easily readable for others. Students who have cognitive challenges, visual impairments, there's a whole ra uh, gamut of issues with documents like this. But even if you're not someone with a disability, this can make it really hard to read your text, right? It might take you a lot longer than it would have taken if it were in a more accessible format. And almost always, there's a way to find it in uh, a better format, either through the library reserves or online. So I think at this point, I probably need to stop and ask for questions. Uh, I did have some technology I was hoping to share, but I was afraid this was ha gonna happen. Um, so if anyone is curious about what technology students are using, um, please let me know. I would love to walk you through. I can also come to department meetings and share with your colleagues as well. But does anybody have any questions right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> well, good. Okay. Wonderful. All right. So um, I'm going to leave it on this slide because I actually included screenshots of technology just in case this wasn't going to work. So let's hope. All right. First, I will show you. Voice Dream. This is a, a newer program. It's a screen reader for students who have learning disabilities and other cognitive challenges. Um, the voices on it are what are, what are we looking at? It's an iPad yes, it's an iPad. Yes. Um, so I will show you Voice Dream. The voices are incredible, um, and the Three that I have downloaded are free samples, and um, there are many more that um, are actually available at a pretty reasonable price. And some students are using this program, but I would say most are using um, other programs. Here at PSU, students, a lot of students are using something called Read Out Loud, but that's not available on the iPad, so I chose not to use that today. However, the concept is the same. It's going to read the text out loud. So let's just. Yeah, thank you. So documents need to be accessible in order for technology to work. And uh, 
usually that means it needs to be a text, uh, I'm sorry, a Word document um, or a PDF that has been OCR recognized, optical character recognition. Uh, software has been used on it and when our office creates textbooks in an accessible format for students typically we put them into PDF formats because they look just like textbooks um, and the student still has their hard copy book in front of them and then they also have this electronic document so that they can be um, engaging in the reading in multiple ways. So I'm just going to try this with uh, the one voice at the one speed, and then we'll make some adjustments so you can see how students would be able to use it. The gardener stayed a week at Longbourn, and what with the Phillipses, the Luckases, and the officers, there was not a day without its engagement. Miss it. Okay. So because of the connection with the iPad and the, the presentation, it's sounding a bit warbled, but... I'm just giving you an idea of how this would be. It actually sounds very clear on just the iPad. Um, and let's go to Saul. I like Saul. And we can make him a bit faster if we're in a hurry. And actually, students do tend to listen to the text a lot faster than you might imagine, just simply because they're used to um, getting information in this way. And so someone might listen to it at this speed. Mrs. Bennett had so carefully provided. Hang on just a second. Oh. Oh, that's. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> um, so that's that, and there's also Deepa, just to give you another idea of another voice. So students can use whichever voice uh, makes most sense to them, whichever voice is most comfortable, but also, you know, if you're reading a text, um, for example, this is Pride and Prejudice, but um, if we were reading something, last night I was reading something about Martin Luther King, and I was using Saul, and I, I was um, really, I felt like I was getting a deeper understanding of the text because of the voice that I was hearing. Not everyone learns that way, but it's another option for students. It's recognizing Mrs. as the end of the sentence, and I only asked it to do one sentence. But you can ask it to do a paragraph or a page. Um, and there are many options, too, with programs like this where it can do, um, it can have a dictionary function and a thesaurus, and so students can be looking up the words as they're, uh, you know, reading through the text. It's a deeper experience um, than just reading in your textbook for a lot of folks. So I'm going to close this. How much does that program cost? Well, this one is actually online. It's uh, in the App Store. You can get this here, this download for free. Um, the voices are really inexpensive. They're like five dollars for the voices. The the um, each of these programs really varies in cost. Firefly is something that is made by uh, Kurzweil, and Kurzweil, if you have it on your desktop, can be fairly expensive. We have it here and in the library. We have it in our office and in the library, and um, it can be fairly expensive. But Firefly, the app is free. So for students who are registered with our office and they have a login from our office, they would be able to then log in for free. Um, I can show you also Dragon Dictation, which is the opposite of what you just heard. It's speech to text. So have you all heard of Dragon Dictation or Dragon Naturally Speaking? So for those of you who haven't, um, a lot of students are using this because they have difficulty in writing. For example, they may have motor deficits, but they also may just have learning disabilities or find it easier to speak. They may even be pressed for time. Um, I find myself using Dragon Naturally Speaking sometimes to do case notes when I'm at the end of the day and I just want to sit back in my chair and go, 
and speak the case notes into the computer. You know, so it's used for a lot of different reasons. But um, this is the app, and it's much less robust than the program you would get on your computer. But this is it. Oh, this is my practice note from earlier. Sorry. I spoiled it. All right, so you would just tap and then give your message. And um, you can also use words for punctuation and for formatting of the document so that it looks the way you want it to look. So let's try this. Good morning, period. Next line. I am presenting at the Portland State of Mind OIT Tech Talks, period. Yeah, it's pretty good. Did I mention this is the free version? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have something to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so screen readers will work uh, with the accessible documents. So even in Drupal, Drupal itself as a framework is accessible. Um, so it's really dependent upon the kinds of documents that are put into Drupal as to how accessible it is. Yeah. Just with pure There are many guidelines. <laughs> yeah, there are many guidelines. I mean, uh, if you're talking just text in the framework of Drupal, um, just typing something in there, then it will be accessible. But if you're adding Word documents and PDFs and Excels and any other kind of uh, information, then, then there's um, guidelines that you need to go by before you even upload them into the system. So uh, I think what I'd like to do at this point is get back to the presentation and show you a five-minute video. Um, and the video was created before I came to PSU. And um, it features, I think, three of our students with disabilities here at the university and um, our provost, Sana Andrews, and our vice president, um, Jackie Balzer is also in the video, and I think it's a good representation of the students who need accessible technology and uh, where the university wants us to be. And before we get there, there's someone in the back who has a question. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I, I didn't ask him to be here. Just <laughs> um, OK, so let's get back to the presentation quickly. And we'll just show the video. And then there will be a couple minutes for questions. So I'm going to skip through my screenshots that I did not have to use. And these are some other devices that students may be using to access the keyboard. So. Um, I don't know if I have a pointer on this. Yes. This is the sip and puff device. So literally, a student would sip to left click and puff to right click. Or maybe it's the opposite. Now I can't remember. But that's how they would access that. And the joystick, um, these are all, uh, both of these actually are joysticks. And then, <coughs> excuse me, this is a head wand. And so 
again, for um, pecking at the keyboard, they would use that device. But some students don't use these devices at all, and so um, if the content is not accessible to tabbing and other keys, then a student who is not able to use the mouse would not be able to do that. <coughs> do we have time for the video? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just forgot the mic, the comments and questions, so. Okay. Let's see if I can. I'm so proud to work at the largest urban university in Oregon and the most diverse. And that diversity includes students with disabilities, whether they are studying here on our campus or at a distance. Many years ago when I did my dissertation for my doctorate, it was on tactual maps, which are maps for the blind. And I mention that because I think oftentimes people don't think about the kinds of resources and tools that are needed by all of our students. I'm Angel Chesimit. I'm a graduate student here at PSU, and I'm also um, totally blind. Uh, my name is Stephen Brown. Um, sign my name is Stephen Brown. I'm a deaf individual. Um, I'm a student here at PSU, and I have been for some time now. Uh, my name is Christine Getman, and I studied community health education at Portland State. Uh, I still need to finish my psychology degree, and I'll be going back to do that very soon. Hi, I'm Terry Blosser, and I'm a student at Portland State. I'm a senior, and uh, my major is history. I use several different com accommodations. I use what we call e-text, and I also utilize something called real-time captioning, and I also utilize something called the FM monitor system. I use a screen reader, and so I need um, documents in a format that my screen reader can access, which means usually a Word document or some PDF documents. So if there is something that's posted and it's not accessible, then that means that I'm only getting like 20% of what's required for that course. I feel like teachers need to maybe be a little more open-minded and understand that need for closed captions. You know, I feel like it, it happens so often for me that I am, I'm watching the interpreter in one place and then there's a TV screen or something else I have to follow um, that's in a, a separate placement to the interpreter. And I, it's like a tennis match. You have to look back and forth. If I'm watching the screen and it has the captions, I can see their face. I can see what's happening. I can see how the voice coincides with the facial expression and the emotion. And I understand all the language that's happening. You know, with the President Obama speech, for example, when they were talking about the health care reform passing, you know, that was, that was a historical moment. That was this huge moment in time, and you knew there was this sense of, of inspiration, and people had that first moment of hearing what had happened, and it would impact all our futures, and it was this important moment in history, and I miss that. I wouldn't change a lot about my experience of using online classes, um, however I would ask that instructors be aware of a time difference for completing online tasks. It takes a little bit longer for me to navigate through the website, as well as completing long written assignments and essays. I can do pretty much what any other student can, but it might take me just a little bit longer because I'm actually listening. Whereas when you use your eyes, you're actually scanning, and um, and that is a lot faster. In my opinion, if a student with a disability discloses that they need a specific accommodation or some sort of arrangement for completing the coursework, um, I believe that is opening the door for the instructor to actually ask questions and make sure that they can serve the student um, appropriately. It's really important for me as a student with a visual impairment to have open communication with instructors in order for me to be successful in a class just like any other student. We're not asked to be treated any different from any other student. We follow the course syllabus just like every other student. We are told, you know, you have to read a hundred, you know, pages or whatever before the next class. Trust me, I have to do two times, three times, possibly even four times as much work to be able to read those 100 pages compared to a normal sighted student. So it's a real challenge, a real challenge for somebody like myself. 
as a community of scholars here at PSU, it's important that we're all committed to creating learning environments that are accessible for all learners. And certainly navigating those online courses and digital media requires us to use resources on campus like the Disability Resource Center in Smith Student Union, that the staff uh, at the Disability Resource Center are consultants and helpers to faculty as they make these it, very important decisions about how to construct the learning environment, what sorts of tools to use, and how to remove barriers to learning in that classroom. So it's, it's just so important that our faculty utilize all the resources that are available to them here at PSU to help both them as instructors and, and scholars to be successful, but especially to help our students to be successful in the classroom. We're really doing a whole rethink of Portland State University's curriculum and we have a great opportunity as we use more and more technology in order to be able to think about the ways in which our students learn and be able to provide them with the tools that they need. So my hope is that all of us, faculty in particular, but all of us really take into account the kinds of things that we need to do to make this a great accessible place for students. I love this video for so many reasons, but um, you know, a lot of institutions wait until something happens um, before they make a statement like this. So I'm knocking on wood all over the place up here. That hasn't happened yet. Um, and yet still we have our administration behind us. So I think that's really exciting. I, again, appreciate the opportunity to come and talk today, and um, thank you very much.